David. David, I read your last book, and I think that we should do this interview standing. The right? Center. Yeah, you sure. say you don't like sitting. I'll do whatever you say. I work for you. <laughs> okay, let's sit. <laughs> David, uh, Lord Martin Rees, the, the royal astronomer of the UK, told me that when he wrote his book, which, which he called Our Last Century Question Mark, his British publisher changed the name to our last century exclamation mark. <laughs> the American publisher changed it to our last hour exclamation mark. Can you tell us the history of the name of your book, The End <laughs> of Illness? I, I wrote the book about four and a half years ago, and I sent it to the publisher, and I called it What is Health? Because to me, it was a key question. I didn't know what health was. Is it a blood test, how you look? Is it how you feel, how long you live, how well you live? I didn't know what health was. And about a week and a half later, the publisher called me and said, Agus, Steve Jobs just called and changed the title of your book. I said, he did what? <laughs> I called up Steve, I go, what are you doing? He said, you can't put the word health in the title. It's a bad word in our country. As soon as you say health, people's eyes glaze over. They think it's like chewing cardboard. So I said, why would you call the publisher, not me? We spoke almost every day. I took care of him his last five or six years. And he said, it's their job to market the book, not yours. I said, okay. So how the so book is... Uh, the title was called The End of Illness. It's bold, it's declaratory. And as Steve said, if there's word health in the title, you can't give it to somebody as a gift because it implies the other person's in bad health. So the year this came out, it was the second most gifted book in all of Amazon.com. So Steve did no marketing. Yeah, that's for sure. He also did no user experience, but this belonged to another issue. How many copies of the book were uh, sold? Worldwide, the first book sold about a million and a half copies. Can I ask you a very Israeli question? Sure. You don't have to answer. Sure. How much royalty you get on any copy? No, no, you don't have to answer. <laughs> well, 100% of the royalties <laughs> go to cancer research. So the truth answer is I get none. Okay, that's fair enough. So you should buy the book. <laughs> now... Now to, we will come to your research, but before that, to your second book. A year ago, you issued a second book, which yeah. is called A Short Guide to Long Life. Yes, it's a lot better than A Long Guide to a Short Life. <laughs> That's, true. That's true. It's like the guy who, who said, uh, while I cut my, uh, a speaker who said, while I cut my, my uh, hair in the, my, my, uh, my hair in the morning, yeah. I thought about my, about my uh, speech and I cut myself. So the, somebody from the crowd so told him maybe you should have thought about your cutting and cut the, 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 the legs of the speech. So it didn't come out well. Okay. <laughs> I tried. Uh, yes. So your new, your new book, which yes. is written like the Internet Time, you know, it's... Not exactly Twitter, but it's really concise and, uh, and, uh, and very, very instructive and, and very, very clearly written. If you have to sum up for us the 10 most takeaways from the book, what, what? Be, will be the 10 most important so the book is 65 rules of to-dos and not to-dos. We so cannot give you time for all the 65, and also you want the, the people to buy the, the book. Uh, so let's talk about 64. No, 10 of them. 10 of them. So they're relatively simple ones. And, you know, simple ones like it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat. So there's remarkable data that if you eat your meals the same time every day, insulin, cortisol come down, you actually reduce stress in the body. So people who graze, that is eat whenever they're hungry, which all the good tech companies now... Who graze, now, raise your hand. You know, all the great tech companies have food at all the time. 81% more diabetes on a weight-adjusted basis. So our bodies were designed through evolution over a million years, basically to make a kill in the wild and have dinner as a group or a family at night and have the leftovers in the morning, and that's it. We weren't made to eat during the day. When you do so... Insulin goes up, and over time, your body gets resistant to it, and it doesn't work well. So you need to be on a regular schedule. The same as when you get up when you go to bed. 600 parents have said, have your kids go to bed whenever they want. Wake them up 10 and a half hours later. Another 600, they said, have them go to the bed the same time every night. Wake up in 10 and a half hours. The same amount of sleep in both arms. 
22% improvement in cognitive function and testing in the kids who went to bed at the same time and got up at the same time. That's good to great right there. So by the way, what's true in kids is even more so true in you and I. There are other rules in there like know yourself. And so this is one especially for you. It's get naked once a month. Look at yourself in the mirror and start to see, are there changes in my body? Measure your blood pressure every day. Measure metrics about you. So when you go to your doctor, it's not to collect data, it's to talk about data. Rule number one, same reason. Rule number two, listen to your body. Rule number three. So rule number three is eat real food. And so our bodies, again, were designed to absorb real food. They weren't designed to have vitamins and supplements and pills. They were designed to have real food. An amazing study came in Israel a couple months ago. It's very cool. What they did was they took the six approved artificial sweeteners, right? Because artificial sweeteners were the greatest food. They hit your sweet tooth, and they weren't absorbed, so there were no calories. So they were the perfect food. And then they looked, and they gave it to first mice, and they gave it to mice for two weeks. Every mouse got prediabetes. Then they gave the mouse antibiotics first, and then the artificial sweeteners, no diabetes. They did the same in 20-year-olds. And what they showed is that these artificial sweeteners aren't absorbed, but they change your bacteria, your microbiome in your GI tract to push the body to diabetes. Rule number three, real food. You have tenfold more bacteria in you than human cells in you. Rule number four is movement over time. So our bodies were designed to move. So in the British Transit Authority, there were 25,000 workers. Half were the bus drivers that sat all day, and half were the ticket takers that walked up and down. They weighed the same smoked the same and lived in the same place, yet dramatically lower heart disease and cancer in the ticket takers. We're a society of bus drivers, right? The richer you are, the more bathrooms in your house, so you don't even have to walk room to room to go to the bathroom. The more important you are in the company, the closer your parking space is to your desk. Rule number four, go and walk as a ticket seller in the British Transit Authority. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you say, no? I'm, I'm with you. Good. Ken. Um, the next rule is uh, store all your data online. They said, when all of us get sick, you know, it's not 9 to 5 Monday through Friday. It's at night or it's when we're traveling. And you try to get your data from your doctor and bring it, whether to an emergency room or a doctor out of town, it's almost impossible. So one of the simplest ways in the long run to get health is just store your own data. Every time you go to your doctor, say, give me a copy of everything. And believe it or not, that simple thing will go a very long way toward health. Rule number five, keep your data. So rule number six is something we mentioned a few minutes ago, which is avoiding the vitamins and the supplements. So if you look through the history of mankind, there is yet to be, well, there's actually one. There's one positive study in the history of mankind showing a benefit to human health to having vitamins or supplements. Yet we spend tens of billions of dollars on these worldwide, every year, so no benefit. And there's actual data that can cause harm. Men who have vitamin E increase the rate of prostate cancer by 17%. Which is good for the industry. Which is very good for the medical industry, that's yeah. very true. The uh, women who take calcium or vitamin D over the age of 70 increase the rate of bone fractures, not decrease. Never been a study showing that calcium and vitamin D help on a health basis. Yet if you look at most women over the age of 60, they take it and there's no benefit. So you go th each one through it, there's no benefit. The first study came out this year showing that a derivative of vitamin B is actually beneficial in preventing future skin cancers for people who've had two or more. And that's the only study that's been positive in the history of mankind. Rule number six, don't make urine expensive by eating b vitamins. <laughs> that's true. That's the only benefit, it sounds, from what you say. Um, rule number seven is moderation. And so while it sounds simple, you need to look, you know, substance by substance of what you do. Up to three cups of coffee a day, health benefit. Over three cups, you start to see a detriment. Alcohol in moderation, right? Alcohol is a, a, a depressant. So you start to drink alcohol, you get tired, you fall asleep. A couple hours later, you get a rebound surge in epinephrine and you wake up. So alcohol has a health benefit, but it needs to be in moderation, not excess. And that has to do with almost everything you do. People exercise too much which I think is part of your issue, <laughs> <laughs> is they actually have health detriments. You know, marathon runners have cardiac defects. And so it's moderation. How about sex? Sex in moderation, as <laughs> Talma has been telling you for... Uh... 
Rule number seven. Rule number eight. <laughs> um, you know, rule number eight is, I'm just trying to think which is the best one to tell you. Rule number eight you is... You have still like 55 to choose from. It's know your grocer. And in today's world, it sounds like a strange, strange rule. But if you look at it, when fruits and vegetables are picked, they start degrading right away to put the nutrients in the soil. And so you want to get what's fresh, or if not fresh, you want to get what's flash frozen, not what's shipped in from every country. You want to go to the store and ask about the fish, right? Mercury in fish is a major issue. The amount of mercury in fish is going up 11% per year. Where does mercury in fish come from? The sea. Where does the mercury come from, though, originally? The mercury came from th broken thermometers. <laughs> Mercury is an impurity in coal. So every time they start a new yeah. coal plant in China, which is two to three a week, that elemental mercury, which doesn't harm us, goes into the atmosphere. And when it rains, bacteria in the ocean convert it to methylmercury. Fish eat the methylmercury, we eat the fish, etc. Well, the first 50 feet or so of the ocean, sunlight degrades methylmercury. But below that, so the big fish and the deep fish have lots of mercury. One serving of swordfish is equivalent on a mercury basis of 103 servings of trout. So you have to be aware of what you eat. And what about alpha omega? If you don't eat, eat fish, where you get the, your alpha omega? So that's a great question. Alpha, so no, omega three. I'm once sorry. one four ounce serving of salmon is equivalent to eleven fish oil capsules. First of all, and so if you're a fisherman, you have a beautiful fish. You sell it to the best fish store in town for twenty dollars a pound. You have an ugly looking, degraded fish. You give it to the fish oil company. So there is yet to be a study in the history of man or womankind showing that fish oil supplements have a health benefit. In fact, the two largest ones had an increase in cancer in the people who had the fish oil supplementation. What are you trying to do to destroy the, the pharmaceutical industry, the vitamin industry, <laughs> and the food industry in one talk? No, I'm just saying eat real food, how we were designed. So the next rule is a great one. The rule so, number 10 I will give, but go ahead. So <laughs> there's a pill a day that if you take it, reduces not the incidence, but the death rate of cancer by 30% heart disease by 22% and stroke yeah, by 19%. This pill is 2,433 years old. Hippocrates described this. He said, when you take the bark of the willow tree and chew it, pain and fever go away. This pill was obviously initially, uh, the, the synthesis came here in Germany, and it's called a baby aspirin. So if everybody over the age of 40 took a baby aspirin a day, we've had more of an effect on how long we live than all of the drugs approved by the US FDA for the last three years combined. Yet most people don't do it. What quantity? 81 or 75 milligrams a day, the equivalent of a low-dose aspirin. Rule number 10, if you want to know more, buy the book called Short Guidance, A Short Guide to Long Life, right? Right. Good. We, are, you are, we are not uh, through yet. You know, we don't have here any time on the screen, so we can talk until afternoon. Steffi, how much time we still have? Um, you have five minutes more. Five minutes more. Tell us as soon, as quick as you can about your, about your research, about what you are doing in your research. So in 1976, if Yassi, you thought you were pregnant, we took a tube of your I blood. I am still pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> we took a tube of your blood and we injected a rabbit. And five days later, we killed the rabbit. A if rabbit the rabbit's frog, ovaries were enlarged, a rabbit. Rabbit. If the rabbit's ovaries were enlarged, you were pregnant. That was the state of the art in 1976. In 1977, along comes a company called Warner Shilcott, and for $9, had the first protein or proteomic test. It's a pregnancy test. Well, rabbits of the world rejoiced, and at the same time, we radically changed maternal health and neonatal health from one test. Well, we now have the ability through technology of looking at all the proteins in the blood. That's the conversation in the body. So I can take a drop of your blood and know what's going on. So the first test we developed with this technology is Who looking... Who is we? My, uh, I founded a company with a guy named Danny Hillis. Who is Danny Hillis? So Danny uh, developed parallel processing supercomputers and discovered rage storage, one of the great uh, technology pioneers, engineers, and someone named Murray Gelman. Murray so discovered the quark and string theory, who's a physicist. So what we developed a way to do is looking in high resolution of all the proteins in the body, that conversation. So the first thing we looked at was colonoscopy, because it's a horrible test, right? Most people who have colonoscopy some don't. Of, some people enjoy it very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Most people don't. 
You know, we develop, excuse me for interrupting. Oh, no, no, please. You know that in Israel we developed this pill that instead of colonoscopy, it has a flashlight, a camera and a transmission, mm -hmm. transmitter. You swallow it and this is uh, uh, instead of colonoscopy. And these guys really gave a whole new meaning to the phrase, the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Continue. Okay. Um, what... The problem with colonoscopy is most people don't need it, right? If you had a colonoscopy and there was no polyp, you didn't need the colonoscopy. So what this is is a blood test for who has a polyp. Really? So in the future, you won't all at age 50 get a colonoscopy because they work, right? They eliminate colon cancer. They're a remarkable test. But the problem is they're inefficient. So you'll have a blood test and you'll say, listen, you need to have a colonoscopy and you have a quality metric. Did the doc do it right? Because did that polyp go away? through the blood test. And at the same time, insurance companies of the future will say, and governments will say, listen, if you have a polyp and you don't get colonoscopy, you get colon cancer, we're not gonna pay. Which is how in the long run healthcare has to go. We need to bring back responsibility for healthcare. Right, right now in the EU, in Israel, in the United States, it is do whatever you want, smoke, be overweight, sit all day, don't get any tests, don't get vaccines, and we as a society p will pay for the healthcare ramifications of your behavior. Well, going forward, that has to change. We all have to take responsibility for what we do. So the power of this technology... Took you guys 12 minutes until you realized that you should, uh, you should applaud for David who came from Los Angeles all the way. Can you try better? Thank you. So the power of this technology is that we can start to look problem by problem. We can look how much heart disease you have and say, that drug you're on for your heart disease, is it the right amount? Right now, it's one size fits all. And with a technology like this, we could do more. You know, as you know, about a decade ago, I founded one of the largest genomics companies. And the idea at the time was spit into a tube, sequence your DNA, and we could start to tell you what's going on. Well, DNA is your ingredient list. Protein is what's going on a moment in time. So the use of these technologies allows us to personalize care, to do things more efficiently, and at the same time, to do the right thing for the right patient at the right time. Before I ask you the last question, I yeah. asked you the one before the last question, speaking about responsibility. I heard you in Davos speaking about the inefficiency of spending $70 billion on cancer research. I think this was the number you cited. So why and how we are doing now? You know, the, the war on cancer, unfortunately, is not one that we're winning. You hear over and over about small wins here and there, and they work. They buy time, weeks to months most of the time. I want a lot more than that. I want to buy years. I want to eliminate this horrible disease, and we're not doing that. Most of the research we do is what we call reductionist, right? There's an experiment that was done in the 1920s that screwed up medicine for the next 90 years. They took 10 people with a large cut on their leg. Half of them they left open to the air, and a half, they took a piece of bread and they dipped it in water and wrapped it around the leg. The people with the bread on their leg healed twice as fast and it screwed up medicine, right? The bread had a mold, the mold made penicillin and it spawned germ theory. Germ theory said, as soon as you know what you're up against, you look, it's this kind of bacteria, you know how to fix it. And it was right. The problem is every other disease, cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, are not from without, they're from within. And they're your body you're intersecting with itself. It's a complex system. So when you're driving you know, from Munich to Berlin and you take apart a car and look at every piece, it doesn't tell you how long it takes to get there. You forgot the weather, the traffic, how much caffeine the driver drank, the bladder size of the driver. And so in cancer, we just keep looking at the car. We forget to look at the system. And so over and over again, most of our progress is looking at that individual car, that cell, that cancer cell. To me, cancer is a verb, not a noun. You're cancering. So my job is not to shrink the, shrink the cancer. It's to change you from a cancer state to a health state, which is a radically different way of approaching health. And the last question, we have to do it. To do it, so what is next? I know it's a question, very wide question, but really in a most concise way, what is next in health? Next frontier in health, and what is the next frontier for David Agus? So I think the next frontier in health is that microbiome that we talked about a few minutes ago. It's that you have tenfold more bacterial DNA in you than human DNA. It's part of your system. So if you take uh, bacteria from a fat human and put it into a skinny mouse after 10 days... Can you use a more 
palatable word than fat human. If you take bacteria from a, an individual who was of large substance. No, no. Somebody, I am, my son say that I am height challenged. He say, <laughs> your weight is okay, but you are too short for, the, for your weight. If you take someone who Archimedes would have loved when he dipped them in water, <laughs> and you take their bacteria and put it into a skinny mouse, after 10 days, the mouse gains about 20% of its body mass. And so what we're going to start to see is that human diseases have a significant component of these bacteria changing us. And given over the next couple of years, we're going to modulate them both to reduce disease and help treat disease. What's next for me is I have a new book out in January, which is about healthcare technology. And it's about where the field is today and how we all have to change at the individual level, society and government to benefit and to adapt to these new changes. You know, Andy Grove called it inflection point. That's when the curve of progress versus time went like this. And when it does, you as an individual, as a company, as a government can succeed wildly if you adapt, but if you don't, you fail. And that's true with much of the technologies that you heard this morning and will continue to heal throughout today and tomorrow. These are parts of the inflection point. And you will see radical changes happening over the next couple of years that gives all of us hope. You know, the first experiments ever that reduced and reversed aging happened this year. So they actually reversed aging. And so it's a, such a powerful concept. You know, the cool part is they were done in 1952 originally, and nobody believed them. You know, this woman at uh, uh, New York Medical College at Cornell took an old mouse and a young mouse, and she put them to sleep and tied their skin together. And after three weeks, she sacrificed the mice. And what she noticed in that old mouse is all of a sudden, new neurons in the brain, the heart beat better, and the muscles were stronger. She claimed she reversed aging. Well, they called her Dracula, Frankenstein, all these crazy names. Well, six months ago, three separate labs, Stanford, University of California, San Francisco, and Harvard, repeated the experiment, and it worked. And what they were able to show is that there were factors in the blood of a young individual that turn on stem cells in you and I that have gone to sleep. And these reactivated stem cells, these quiescent stem cells that became awake again, can actually start to form and make bones heal quicker, make the brain have new neurons, to give hope that we can actually reverse the aging that we're all going through right now. Right. I have to make two, two personal comments. Number one, I, I will tell Talma it's not me, it's the bacteria. <laughs> right? Okay. And number Fair. two, I, I hate to say it, but I took most of your uh, talk as a personal attack on me. So... Uh, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful David Agus. Okay. Let me give you a hand.